Turn to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. I don't believe I had these last time I was here. I'm trying to get used to them. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe of man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you, and lead them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over Jordan, and the waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the ark of the covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hastened and passed over. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over, the ark of the Lord passed over and the priests in the presence of the people and the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses spake unto them. About 40,000 prepared for war, passed over before the Lord unto battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come ye out of Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up unto dry land, that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place, and flowed over all his banks as they did before. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Galgil. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye may fear the Lord your God forever. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we read in these passages and see such wonderful miracles, but Father, the wonder of your grace is it no less a miracle we hear of your Son, we beseech you that we may decrease and you may increase before us this night. Father, we just desire to glorify Christ, to help the brethren, and to magnify your name among us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Um, for our devotional, we're going to be looking at this passage in Joshua. But before I 
do that. It's good to see, it's been a while, I can't remember how long it's been since I've been here, but it's good to see some familiar faces. And when I see such things, it, it's just wonderful. Seeing the faithfulness of God in each and every one of you. And I think about what John wrote. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, that the Lord's children, walk in truth. And to see some of your faces, and there's new faces here that I haven't seen, let us walk together. But it is so... I've been doing this for a little while now, and not everybody loves this gospel. And they walk away. They'll come in here, and they'll walk away. But for some reason, tonight, we're here together. Let us honor and glorify His name. Well, I've got just three points for us this evening. Three simple thoughts. The first thing, let me look back at chapter 3 and read verse 17. And the priest that bare the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over. And my first thought is found in verse 1. And I was looking at this, just boom, right? First thing, first verse, here it is. And it came to pass when some of the people were clean passed over Jordan. Is that what it says? It came to pass when a third of the people were clean passed over. No? If I read this right, if I understand it right, it says all the people were clean, passed over. And that word clean is completely. So if I understand it right, every single person intended completely passed over the River Jordan without so much as any real harm coming to them and not even losing one single person. I know you're familiar with this passage. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. <laughs> and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven to do uh, mine uh, to not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, said Christ, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Clean. Completely saved. Totally redeemed. Matter of fact, it would be an impossibility for one such as our Christ, the Christ, to set out to accomplish redemption and to fail at any point. It's just an impossibility. We preach a successful Savior. We preach a victorious Redeemer. We don't preach a God who tries to do anything. We don't preach a God that we say, if you let Him do such and such. No. We preach a covenant God covenant mercies, covenant grace. I will redeem. When he hung on the cross, he said, it's finished. It is finished. Like Judah of old, if you remember in Genesis, who said, I will be surety for the lad. And if I do not bring him back home with me, I will bear the blame forever. Now, he was talking about Benjamin. Benjamin's security, Benjamin's safety was in the hands of Judah. We sing that song, Under the Blood of Jesus, Safe in the Shepherd's Fold. Under the Blood of Jesus, Safe while the ages roll. Safe though the worlds may crumble. Safe though the stars grow dim. Under the Blood of Jesus, I am secure in Him. And I'm 54 years old. I feel like I'm 64, 74. But 
Every time I look in this book, I just am continually reminded of the simplicity, the singularity of the gospel. And what I find endearing through the ages is that His Word, it cannot fail. And this book is a book of promises. Mr. Spurgeon said, read the book, gather up the promises, and then spend them at leisure. When you're struggling, when things are difficult, to say the least, go back and look at the Word and remember everyone for whom He intended shall pass over. Shall pass over. That's the first thought. Now the second thought we find in verses 5 through 9 and 21 through 24. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan. Take every man a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel. That it may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come saying, What meaneth these stones? Then you can tell them what this means. And then in verse 21, he basically recounts it and says, He spake to the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us, until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth, everybody, not just your children, may know the hand of the Lord, it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord, your God, forever. The second thought is, we are to recount, we are to memorialize, we are to preach in the ears of our children, and to any who will hear, the gospel of the sovereign grace of God. You look at what happened. This is what happened. We tell our children, and we tell anyone who we're working with, who we see on the street, who is interested, we tell them of God's sovereign grace in salvation. He says He brought us out of our Egypt and caused us safely to arrive in Canaan. The journey was, not, was never in any doubt. They were to cross the, over the, the River Jordan on dry ground. God is, in His sovereign grace, is sovereign, is immutable, omnipresent, omniscient, in our salvation. Because what happened there, only before the Red Sea, it, it never had happened before. We tell... All who will hear, especially our children, God is on the throne. Scott used to say, either God is governed or not. Either God will govern or he'll not. Either God is on his throne or he's not. I mean, that's, that's the only two things you got. Either he's governed or he governs. We preach, God governs. Second thing I think we see in here simply is God's sovereign mercy to a people totally undeserving. Totally undeserving. The Scripture says His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. If, the, if, if salvation depended on our faithfulness, probably it's going to fall when we leave here. Or maybe even before. So we speak... Tell our children, we tell anyone who will hear of God's sovereign grace and salvation. He, he alone accomplished the feat. Took us from one side to the other. Secondly, we speak of God's sovereign mercy to a people totally undeserving. Paul said, I'm less than the least. I'm not even fit to be called an apostle. That's because that's what the grace of God does. It shows us that we are an undeserving people. Thirdly, I think it's, we tell folks that God is sovereign in uh, power in His purpose and decree. He set His eye upon His people. They're the apple of His eye. And He has brought every event and every circumstance to pass in order to fetch us like He did Mephibosheth. Go, is there anybody left of the house of Saul? 
for, that I can show mercy. Yeah, there's just one. Oh, and incidentally, he can't do a thing for himself. He's lame on both feet. Go fetch him. Murray's Montgomery called Fetching Grace. Fetching Grace. We speak of God's sovereign power and His purpose and His decree. There's no, there's no such thing as luck. There's no such thing as you know, an accident or this or that. We believe that all things, all things, you know, it's like a, like a, like a cog in a gear. Every single thing is working together for good to them who love God and are called, the called. They were called. Weren't they called? In their, our passage? Sure they were. According to his purpose, there it is. His purpose. And fourthly, we must tell people of God's sovereign preservation of his people. Look at verse... Uh, um, see where they passed over in verse 16 of the previous chapter. and uh, That the waters which came down from above, stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam, and the five Zeratan, besides Zeratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. Right against Jericho. Now, you tell me this. If you got thousands of people and you're kind of making them go, not in a single file, but you're kind of making them, you're, you're squeezing them to go over the Red Sea or, or the Jordan, when are you the most vulnerable? Right then. The people of Jericho, hey, look it, let's go wipe them out. But if you read the first three chapters, because the people of Jericho heard what, it, what God had done for his people, every man's heart fainted. And, and oftentimes in life or situations, even with believers especially, we struggle. He's going to preserve and take care of His people. If He sent His Son to die, nothing was ever so free that cost so much. Nothing was ever so free that cost so much. If He sent His Son to suffer, bleed, and die for us, for His people. And the Scripture says He's able to keep us from falling. And I believe He will. The last point, and found in verse 14, And on that day the Lord magnified Joshua. Now you know Joshua, the, the, the name means Savior. And you know that's just a beautiful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. And also the Ark of the Covenant, that went before them. Christ is our captain of our salvation. He goes before us. There's just so many wonderful types and pictures here. But my point, and my last point is, is that they magnified and feared Joshua. The word magnified is simply to make large. And the word feared is simply to be in awe or reverence. All or reverence. Isn't this what we do as believers when we hear of our Lord being lifted up among us? Isn't this what we do when we gather together the fellowship of believers? We make His name large. We can't, we can't make it near as large, but that's our desire, is to make it large. To, to, to lift Him up. Lift Him up before all to see. And we reverence Him. We're in all of Him. Because He is our all in all. We seek no one but Christ. We desire to be more like Him. I could ask any, anybody in here, are you, and I, I don't, I'm not sure how to word it, satisfied, happy, whatever, with your knowledge of Christ? Don't you want to know more about Him? From the, from the youngest to the old? Don't you want to learn more of Christ? Don't you want to love Him more? Be filled with Him? And, yes, and, and these little children, what, you know, what's their goal? They don't want to be a child all their life. They want to grow up. And it's the same with the believer. We want to grow up in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that happens, I know it happens, when we gather together and reverence Him. When we hear about the Christ of this book and reverence Him. Because rev the lovely thing about reverence is that it shows itself up in worship. It shows itself in love. It shows itself in adoration. It shows itself in obedience. And it shows itself 
when we fellowship with those who also reverence God. That's why, you know, when you go out and work in the world or you rub shoulders with this world, <laughs> it's, it is difficult because they don't reverence God. At least the God of Scriptures, they may have a, some small reverence to their God that they've created. But when you gather together with those of like mind, it did take us two minutes of like mind. Land down under. We've got we've got a we've got a, a, a church family. We've got a brother and sister. When you gather together and we speak a hymn in reverence, that fellowship is sweet. It's so sweet. So everyone for whom he came, they're gonna make it. If you see anybody, especially your children, talk to your children. And I mean, even after they're gone and married, they're still your children. See anybody, anybody you can talk to, tell them of Christ. And reverence Him only and always. Pastor.